Hi, hello, and welcome to Capelus Electora Pace, uh, the 14th edition of this conference uh, for uh, foreign language teachers. Um, my name is Alexandra Paparucha, and I will be talking today about something that I call the clean wheel for language and subject teachers. I understand that most of you are language teachers, English teachers, but maybe also French, or Spanish, uh, or Russian teachers. Uh, but maybe you know subject teachers who are involved in CLIL, um, and you might need to cooperate with them. Uh, so once again, CLIL will for language and subject teachers. Um, as a short introduction um, about myself, I come from Torun uh, in Poland. Uh, my first profession is geography. My second profession is, is um, being an English teacher and now teacher trainer. Um, and I really like uh, referring to my um, city for this reason. I'm quite sure you can recognize this gentleman, uh, Nicolas Copernicus. Um, I like using him as an example of a person who was multilingual. Uh, we know for certain that his family spoke German, so that was his uh, first language. But uh, in, in his times, Torun was a bilingual city, uh, so he must have uh, spoken Polish as well. Um, although we don't have written documents with Copernicus using Polish. Uh, he also spent 10 years in Italy, so we can conclude that he spoke Italian. He must have learned Italian. But of course, the fourth language was Latin, the language of education. Uh, and although it was a few hundred years ago and we wouldn't be talking about CLIL, but it was a little bit similar situation to students now studying subjects through a language that is not native to them. For example, uh, learning geography through uh, through English. Um, okay, so uh, the outline of my presentation is as follows. I'm going to uh, talk about CLIL as a method, how I understand it. I will be talking about different types of CLIL and actually uh, I'll stress two major types of CLIL. Um, why CLIL? is something that you might consider introducing into your teaching. And the main part is going to be this concept of CLIL wheel uh, that could be a support for language teachers who want to get involved in CLIL, but also for subject teachers who want to get involved in CLIL. So let's start. CLIL as a method. Uh, you might find different definitions of CLIL. Uh, but uh, most of them will be similar to this one uh, by Ball, Clegg and Kelly uh, from 2015. CLIL here is described as a method uh, to be used in any situation where non-linguistic content, that is school subjects that are not foreign languages, such as biology, physics, geography, or, or music or other subjects, is merged with a foreign language very often it is English, but it can be uh, Italian, French or Russian in or outside the classroom. So we don't limit uh, CLIL to the classroom situations, but it can also be something that, for example, students uh, do uh, on a field trip or in a museum. Uh, OK, nothing special in this definition. However, I really like how those authors approach CLIL because they talk about CLIL being single focused. And this is a new uh, concept uh, because the majority of um, literature on CLIL talks about uh, dual focus. Uh, so then you approach the lesson uh, with those two um, aims or goals in your mind that your students are going to uh, study the content and learn the content, uh, the subject, but also my goal should be to teach them the language. 
And actually, uh, I used to teach geography through English in lower secondary and secondary schools in Poland. And I remember years ago had a problem with this dual focused approach to CLIL. Um, yes, I teach geography through English, but my goal is not to teach the language as such. Uh, so if it is a single focused uh, approach to education, then what is it? Is it content um, or something else? The authors describe this uh, uh, one single focus as uh, what you can see on the screen. We need to teach the students to help them, to enable them to use the language. Yes, the language is there, but they need to be able to use this language effectively to express those subjects, to talk about those subjects. So, for example, when I taught geography through English, I had to make sure that I can have a discussion with my students about some concepts in geography using a foreign language. Um, and I really like this uh, idea of CLIL being single focused and this single focus described as it is described here. Um, I know that if, if you are a language teacher, you might be using um, CLIL a little bit differently. Um, your, your first goal at school is to teach your students the language. But if you want to get engaged in CLIL, think of this single focus of CLIL. Um, okay, so now let's move on to two major types of CLIL. Yes, I know that specialist literature will uh, describe um, many more different types of CLIL. Uh, CLIL is something that is not uh, uniform through a country or between countries. Uh, between schools, there are big differences. In specific uh, classrooms, it is going to be different. But I would like us to focus on two major types of CLIL. The first one is so-called hard CLIL. And this is something that I did as a subject teacher because hard CLIL is delivered in a subject class. Uh, so when I taught geography through English, I was engaged in hard CLIL. Uh, my teaching geography through English was part of the geography uh, uh, timetable. Uh, by a subject teacher, so in that situation, I was playing the role of a subject teacher and I remember struggling a little bit to turn off my language teacher uh, part of the brain, I would say. Um, and of course, subject driven. So my major um, kind of guidelines through whatever I was doing was the geography curriculum. Um, I don't think there should be any problem with understanding that. Uh, the next one might be a little bit challenging. But before we move on to the next one, I would also like to make a point of that, that a hard clear teacher, a subject teacher, is also responsible for the language. So me as a teacher of geography, I was responsible for teaching the language of geography. Uh, uh, the teaching the, the language of geography to my students. And it didn't matter whether it was done in Polish or in English. Uh, geography taught in Polish also has got a massive list of different vocabulary items. And this is me who is responsible for teaching my students uh, this language of geography. And so teaching geography through English was not that much different. I was responsible for the language of geography in a lesson of geography taught through English. Okay, so now something for language teachers, soft CLIL, uh, done in a language class. Uh, very often in Poland, it is English, 
but um, there are also other uh, languages used. It can be German, French. In Australia, you can have uh, clear classes done through Japanese or Italian. So it doesn't have to be English, but it is part of a language class by a language teacher, which means that the, the, the teacher himself or herself is not a specialist in the subject, which might be really interesting because you might choose the area that you want uh, to experiment uh, uh, with on CLIL. Uh, maybe uh, you like history and you want to experiment with that. Or maybe you, you like science experiments and you would like to practice this. Um, if you are a subject teacher, you have no um, space for, for this kind of thing. The curriculum dictates everything. Um, however, if you want to engage in CLIL, I would, I would um, suggest that you talk to subject teachers who teach your students. Because the third part here, and this might be a little bit controversial, is that soft CLIL also should be subject driven. Again, I know you are language teachers, but if you want CLIL, Put your language part of brain aside, or mind aside. Um, forget grammar, third person, singular, uh, uh, um, irregular verbs, and so on. Uh, the subject as such should be the, um, the, the driving force behind a clear lesson. And this is also why it might be very uh, good to talk to subject teachers, biology, physics, um, history, mathematics, uh, that teach the same class that you teach. Um, ideally, the topics that you decide to introduce in your lessons, clear lessons, are going to be connected somehow to the curricula that, that your students are covering in other classes. That would be ideal. Um, and as such, you need to take responsibility for the content. So even if the student gives a good answer, grammatically correct answer to your question, but the content is wrong, you need to say, this is wrong, okay? London is not the capital of um, Scotland, for example. Okay, uh, London is the capital of the United Kingdom. Okay, so not only the language, um, uh, the content should be uh, uh, really your uh, major area of interest in soft clean lesson. Um, okay, so why? why? Why do we talk about clear over and over again? Um, when one big area it comes from a little bit of criticism towards EFL um, because in a clear situation, you can show your students that the language is a tool. Okay, language is a tool in um, conducting a, a science experiment or describing a historical event. It's a tool. Um, it's not a goal in itself. Uh, the content is authentic. It's part of the curriculum that your students are doing anyway. Um, so an, an authenticity, authenticity of the, the, the text, for example, in an EFL classroom is a big thing. Here, you've got everything authentic. It's part of, for example, biology curriculum for grade seven. Uh, it is as, as authentic as it can be. Um, another thing might be students' motivation. Um, yes, a clear lesson might be challenging for students, um, but might also be very rewarding. For example, uh, when you shift the stress from grammar and, and uh, vocabulary items that, that you've been teaching uh, before into something that is tightly connected uh, to, for example, a science experiment that you want to do in your CLIL class, um, 
students might be more motivated and better motivated to actually learn, use this language effectively. And last but not least in this list is um, thinking skills. Um, there are publications that talk about, um, you know, how to make language students practice and um, and and upgrade their thinking skills. Here you you've got everything. You've got the thinking skills connected to the subjects, um, used in various uh, uh, ways and expressed in various ways. It's there. Um, and there's one thing more that I would like to talk about here. Uh, we actually shouldn't be talking about two elements. We shouldn't be talking about content as being separated from the language or the language being separated from the content. There is nothing like that. Uh, and I can tell you an anecdote of me as a primary uh, geography teacher um, when I uh, gave my students a test, it was plenty of years ago, there it was, we were talking about um, agriculture in South America uh, and what people grow there. And one of the, it was a lesson in Polish, and one of the things that people grow in South America is sugar cane, trzcina cukrowa. And I remember being surprised, shocked even, how my students wrote Trzcina Cukrowa in Polish. There were six or seven different versions of spelling the word Trzcina Cukrowa. And it occurred to me that actually that was my fault that they made a mistake because I never wrote it on the board. Maybe they saw it in the books, but I didn't. I didn't point it out, uh, and this is the this is the language of geography, and I have to teach my students the language of geography. I'm responsible for this language, and as language teachers, if you look into any course book that you use, there is a lot of content there. There is a text about history, for example. There is a text about tourism. There is a text about uh, modern technologies. This is content. And you can't teach the language without using some content. Um, and your subject teachers in the past taught you the language of their subjects. If you look at this slide, I'm quite sure that you are going to recognize um, all the different subjects that are represented here. Uh, this is very often graphic form, but this is part of the language of those subjects. Uh, uh, starting from the top left corner, as I see it, we've got um, uh, we've got um, uh, biology, we've got music, we've got chemistry, physics. Um, uh, history, mathematics, uh, geography, history of art. And I don't think you've got any problems with that because the language, uh, sorry, the content teachers, subject teachers taught you the language of uh, those subjects. So we should, we should, we should stop talking about two elements here. Um, Okay, and now I would like to move on to this major part here, uh, the clear wheel for teachers, for subject teachers and for language teachers. Uh, some of the parts, some of the elements might be surprising for subject teachers and obvious for language teachers and the other way around. Um, okay, one of the uh, big thing in CLIL uh, so-called four C's. Uh, Coyle, Hood and Marsh published a book in 2010 when they talk about four C's. And I also remember preparing geography lessons, my geography lessons in, in, in lower secondary and high school uh, based on that. C for content, my subject, geography, whatever I need to teach according to my curriculum. 
communication, okay, the language, how am I going to um, express and talk about those concepts, what do I want from my students, cognition, thinking, everything is fine. And I really remember struggling with culture. Uh, it was described as, as an element that uh, has to be included in, uh, in CLIL. But not all geography lessons were really easily seen through culture. Um, so th that is why I would like to see three of those C's in that form, in the form of a wheel, communication, content, cognition. And I would like to see the last C as in this outside ring. Uh, because how we communicate depends on culture. How and what content we teach depends on culture. Uh, you might be surprised, but it's not only history. Of course, history comes uh, or literature comes. Uh, they come as uh, those first subjects that you can think about. Yes, different countries teach uh, them differently, but even geography. If I look through geography course book and geography curriculum in Poland and geography curriculum in the UK, it's different. Uh, sometimes I have a feeling it's, it's, it's a different subject. Um, there's a different approach to geography. Uh, in the US, as I understand, geography is part of humanities. For me, geography is science. Um, so yeah, so content also depends on culture. Um, and the last one is cognition, so thinking. Um, how we think depends on our culture. In some publications, the force uh, the, the, the last C is not culture, it's context, for example, or community. Uh, but w whatever you call it, it is something outside, something that uh, communication, content and cognition depend on or are based on. OK, so this is kind of more traditional thing, looking at the four C's of CLIL. And I would like you to consider combining those four C's with something that is called 10 CLIL parameters. Uh, Ball, Clegg and Keller in their book in 2015 uh, said, OK, uh, we don't want to look at communication content or cognition. We've got those 10 CLIL parameters. Uh, they combine them with communication or content, but they kind of put those, 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 those four C's a little bit aside. Um, I, try to merge, combine those two in one graphic visual form um, for, for example, uh, for teacher training that I deliver. Uh, uh, I very often work with subject teachers, but also language teachers. And this is something that can be useful uh, for those both groups of teachers uh, when they prepare their uh, CLE lessons. So what are those 10 CLIL parameters? I would like to start uh, with those connected with the content. So the subject that I teach, for example, my geography. Uh, those um, parameters connected with content might be the biggest challenge for language teachers. The first one, the first parameter talks about a sequence, one, two, three sequence. What does that mean? A sequence means a series of lessons or a project, but not one single lesson. Um, so, for example, if you use a course book and your course book contains so-called clear pages at the end of the unit and one CLIL page is about mathematics and at the end of the next unit the CLIL page is about biology and yet another one is about history. Um, th this might be a good start to a proper CLIL sequence, CLIL series of lessons. If it is one page and 
you just address it in one lesson, then it misses a huge element of content teaching. If I teach geography, I teach students every week. I teach them, uh, I, I, might, might have, I may have two lessons a week, for example. So I see them regularly and I teach them regularly. So if, you, if we want to actually gain uh, uh, the most from introducing CLIL in language classes, one of the first things is going to be this. Make sure this is a sequence of lessons, maybe three, maybe four, but not just one. One of the things that you can use is prior knowledge. Uh, if it is just one lesson, yes, you can ask your students, okay, have you heard about this? What do you know about that? But if it is a second lesson, there is already something that your students have learned and you may ask them, okay, what do you remember from the previous lesson? We need that. Let's revise it because we need this content in, in, in the lesson today. And the next lesson is coming and it's going to be uh, the continuation of something that we are doing. So prior knowledge, a sequence of lessons. Um, and another thing that we do in subjects is showing a bigger picture. This is one of the elements that makes learning uh, more effective, that the students know where they are. Um, so for example, I remember teaching um, the, the kind of analyzing the countries of Europe uh so in one lesson or in two lessons we would be doing scandinavian countries and then next lesson we would be doing mediterranean uh countries like greece italy and so on so so showing a bigger picture would mean we are in europe okay we are in europe we are analyzing the the looking at the similarities and differences between different countries in different parts of the continent this is the bigger picture um oh, there are a few other things that we could talk about here but i need to move on um to the next one and actually to the next two parameters this one talks about the concept more important or bigger or dictating the language and this one talks about the specific task dictating the language what does that mean the concept might be something that i teach in my subject uh, so for example one of the concepts that i might teach in in geography is how mountains um, are a, you know form a, a landscape barrier and on this kind of a barrier um, um, rainfall may happen if the, the, there are proper uh, conditions around this is a concept um, why in the mountains we've got more rain uh, why at the foot of Himalayas you've got the highest rainfall uh, globally uh, this is a concept that I want to teach. And this concept is going to dictate me the language that I'm going to use. But also, if, you, if I look at a specific task that I want my students to do, this task will, will also dictate the language. So, for example, for talking about the uh, rainfall, higher rainfall in the mountains, I might ask my students to uh, analyze some maps, okay? So this is a task, okay? Open your atlas or find a map online, uh, check, show, uh, you, you know, what's the rainfall in the Himalayas, for example. This is a specific task. This task will di uh, dictate the language as well. Um, so when I say the language, what, what do I mean? I mean specific vocabulary, specific grammar and specific functions. So for example, uh, if you talk, if you want to teach your students, um, for example, about plants, uh, animal and um, plant cells, what they contain, uh, there is specific vocabulary there. For example, 
membrane, cell membrane, cell wall, um, lysosomes, mitochondria. There is a lot of vocabulary there. Next, grammar structures. If you want to teach about um, King Henry VIII, you will be using simple past. Whether, whether your students know simple past or not, if you want to talk hen about Henry VIII and his six wives, uh, you need to use simple past. But it is also about language functions. Uh, for example, you want to do conduct a scientific experiment. So what's the language for hypothesizing? Okay, what, what, what are those uh, language functions? Um, for example, how to express a definition if you need. So all this will stem from the concept that you teach and the specific task that you want your students to perform. Okay, the next one, and, this, and we are still here in the content uh, C for content, guided multimedia input. Uh, input is everything that we uh, are trying to teach our students and, and all the tools that we use to, uh, to teach the students. Multimedia shouldn't be a surprise. Uh, it means uh, using uh, visuals in various forms, still pictures, but also videos, uh, other recordings. Uh, ideally, if it is personalized, uh, this multimedia uh, uh, is going to be a powerful tool in the teacher's hands. Uh, but also it needs to be guided. That is, we talk about scaffolding guided, chopped into smaller bits and pieces, uh, prepared. Um, if it is a recording, playing playing the recording twice or stopping the recording in the middle, uh, pre-teaching vocabulary. You know quite a lot of things about that because you are language teachers. Uh, but in CLIL, it's not only about scaffolding the language, it is also, or most importantly really, about scaffolding the concept as such, the concept that I'm trying to teach. Um, okay, uh, and now we will be kind of in between C for content and C for communication. This is something that the um, Paul Clegg and Kelly uh, call three dimensions of CLIL. Three, two of them are kind of obvious, content and language but the last one is a procedure. So content is my geography that I want to teach my students. Um, for example, uh, different uh, ways of presenting statistical data in a visual form, like a line graph or bar graph or a pie chart. Uh, this is part of my geography curriculum. There is a language that comes with that. For example, the terms like pie chart and bar graph. But also, there is also in my lesson something that they call, those authors call a procedure. So what do I really want my students to do? For example, if I teach this statistics, I may ask them to read a line graph or to look at statistical data in, in a table form and use this data for making their own bar graph. This is a procedure. Um, and the big thing is which part, which of those three dimensions is the most challenging? And I remember the lessons, uh, my lessons of geography, uh, when the content was so difficult that I didn't even use English because I thought that the content is so complex, even if I use native language, uh, that I, I just, we just had a short summary at the end of the lesson. It was about uh, the yearly movement of the Earth around the sun and, and how the globe is affected by that. That's a quite a complex uh, concept. Uh, but sometimes the language might be a 
huge challenge. If I look at the lesson on uh, that compares plant cell and animal cell, there are so many terms like those lysosomes and mitochondria. Uh, I don't even remember all of them. Uh, there are 15 terms uh, that are long and complex and problems with spelling and problems with pronunciation. So if I've got a lesson like that, I know that I should have more, I should spend more time on dealing with this language. And sometimes the procedure as such might be challenging. For example, if you want your students to make a mind map and they've never done it, it's just absolutely first time they've never seen it, they've never done it, uh, they've never made any, you know, drawn anything like that, the procedure itself is going to be challenging. So those authors are talking about tuning in every lesson might have a little bit more stress somewhere else than another lesson. Um, now we're going to move to the part that is connected with communication. So, so something that might be uh, challenging for subject teachers, but should be more obvious for language teachers. For example, the first parameter is key language. Uh, how to make sure that the students practice the language, practice uh, speaking, practice uh, uh, spelling, for example, of new vocabulary, pron uh, pronunciation of the new vocabulary, how to make sure that students revise this vocabulary um, uh, regularly, um, how to make sure that they can see the vocabulary in the classroom, uh, for example, uh, through uh, posters that show for example, the elements of, um, of a volcano with the vocabulary there. Okay, this is a cone, uh, this is a um, um, vent, uh, this is lava, this is magma, um, all words written, but also with a picture to support uh, learning the language. So this, uh, this should be uh, quite obvious. Uh, the next element is about the instructions. It is also part of communication and it is also something that might be a challenge uh, for uh, subject teachers. Language teachers also might be uh, think about um, here being very careful uh, because it happens very often that students cannot do the task not because they don't know how to do the task but because they don't understand the instructions. Um, and in a clear situation, we don't want the students uh, to be challenged extra by instructions that are too long, uh, too complicated, too, uh, too many uh, pieces of instruction given at the same time, um, or maybe uh, a teacher might need to repeat them because students are not paying attention. So, Instructions play a, a huge role um, in a clear lesson. Um, okay, the next uh, parameter is called student-student interaction. And again, uh, it is about uh, the students producing the language, uh, ideally in an oral form. Uh, and it shouldn't be the, you know, a teacher-student interaction, but student-student interaction, because I want all the students to be involved at the same time in discussing um, a concept, for example. Uh, again, this is something that subject teachers might uh, find challenging, because very often um, subject uh, lessons might be more traditional when, when the teacher wants to lead the, the lesson all the time. Um, this student-student interaction has got, um, you know, an important role in learning subjects. One, um, students learn better uh, the concepts that we want to, uh, them to, to, to learn if they can talk about those concepts. So I need to make sure that there is time for that. But also, the students can rehearse 
uh, for example, an answer to a question with another student. And this rehearsal is super important because it gives students time for practicing the language. Do I know specific language to give this answer? But also, am I right thinking that this is a good answer? So on two levels, students can, can rehearse their answer by discussing it with, with another student. Um, I can also think about um, other ways of making uh, students interact with each other, like giving presentations or holding group discussions. Um, and it is not going to be a big problem if the students switch uh, to their native language. Uh, they might do it, uh, they are preparing, they need to rehearse, they may need to make sure that they understand the concept first, and then they can think about the language that they need to ac actually express uh, this concept. And the next, um, the last element of this communication, C, is supported output. So output is everything that the students prepare. In, in what form? So the obvious ones would be speaking and writing, but there are other ways of, um, you know, producing some output. This can be a drawing, this can be making something, that can be building something. Uh, but the important word here is supported. So if I want my students to speak, again, Language teachers know those tools. I can prepare a substitution table. I can prepare a mind map that is going to be a support for speaking. Or I can uh, have um, um, a sentence starters. Uh, so I need to support uh, my students in whatever they uh, are supposed to produce. Uh, I suppose you know that the, the worst thing you can do is to give the, your students an empty piece of paper and a question, and this might be a huge challenge. So I need to support my students in writing, for example. Um, okay, and the last but not least, again, it is just one of the 10 parameters, uh, but it's a huge thing in teaching subjects. We don't want the students to just memorize and, and tell me the, uh, um, the elements of the um, an, a, a plant cell or animal cell or, or memorize the, the dates and history. I want them to think. And there is a big thing in, in EFL also, how to teach uh, students thinking, how to make sure that they think in an English lesson. Clearly gives you ready material for thinking. So what can I do to help my students with thinking? Questions, good questions. And these questions might be asked by teachers, but also students. Let's not forget that students might uh, be asked to ask questions. I can use thinking routines like think, pair, share. So I give a question, give my students time to think and then they need to pair up with someone else, discuss the answer and then share with the whole class. And this think, pair, share can be changed into think, write, pair, share uh, as a variation of uh, this thinking routine. Or this one, see, think, wonder, okay? Uh, when I show my students a picture, a painting, for example, what do you see? What do you think about this picture? And um, what are your uh, uh, questions? What do you wonder about? Um, there are other thinking routines. It's, it's, these are really good tools to make sure that students think. Uh, visual organizers or other uh, 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 kind of non-linguistic representations, as they are called, are also very good for thinking. Okay, so what we looked at is something that I call clear wheel, 
that combines the more traditional approach to what CLIL uh, is, four C's of CLIL, uh, content, communication, cognition and culture with 10 CLIL parameters. Uh, the, the wheel is, an, is, an, is a visual uh, tool. Uh, it's a graphic representation of those 10 parameters. It can be used as a checklist. Um, for example, if you want a lesson to, to, to conduct a clear lesson, you can look at it and say, okay, what do I need to pay attention at? Okay, wh 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 where do I need to work more? Uh, do I make sure that my multimedia input is guided and uh, are my instructions clear? Okay, have I got a sequence of lessons? Um, okay, in a summary and a kind of re reflection, the biggest takes from this presentation, I hope for you, would be that soft clear is or should be subject driven that you shouldn't be thinking, oh, I need to teach third, uh, I need to teach um, conditional sentences. So maybe I'm going to have um, a, a science experiment and we will be hypothesizing. Um, I would like you to be thinking the other way around. Let's, let's have fun with science and the language will come next. Um, and then, this vocabulary, this grammar and language functions will come with the concept that you want to teach and will come with the task that you want your students to perform. And I hope that um, at the end of this presentation, you might have a list of three things to use, two things to remember, and possibly one question. Uh, so three, two, one. This is also something that you might ask your students to do at the end of your clear lesson as a summary and reflection uh, connected with your lesson. Three, two, one. Um, th these are all the references that I used in this presentation. Uh, I'm on social media. You can find me on YouTube, uh, Instagram, also Facebook. Uh, it's called Clear Matters. Um, this is also an email address uh, you can write if you want to uh, talk about CLIL, um, soft CLIL, hard CLIL, or any other CLIL uh, that you uh, are thinking about. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you, Pace, for having me here. Um, I, I'm, I'm really happy I could talk about CLIL. CLIL is my passion uh, and I um, wish everyone a really uh, good conference today. Thank you and goodbye and happy CLILing! <laughs>